off, folks. Welcome. It is 12 p.m., so we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's nice to see some familiar names. Uh, welcome, welcome. This is the first of five webinars we are going to be hosting this winter and spring season. Uh, our next presentation is actually going to be on March 30th at 12 p.m., and we'll feature breadfruit with Noelle Dickinson of our Regenerative Organic Breadfruit Agroforestry Project and an update on discovery of some new ulu species and more. I'll be dropping the link to register for the March webinar shortly into the chat box. Uh, also, if you'd like to be kept in the know and are already subscribed to our monthly science and conservation newsletter, Go Botanical, you can sign up on our website and I'll drop that link in a moment too. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. We'll be sending the recording out to you all in the next few days. Please feel free to ask questions in the chat box throughout the presentation, and we'll also hold a general Q&A at the end. If we don't get to one of your questions, please feel free to follow up with me via email, uh, which I'll, again, drop into the chat for you. We're hosting today's session from our Botanical Research Center on Kauai, as well as our Kahanu Garden on Maui. I have with me Dr. Nina Ronsted, our Director of Science and Conservation, and she's going to tell you a little bit about today's session. Welcome to all of you um, to this webinar. We're so excited that we're having you joining us today. So with this new series of webinars, we want to invite you behind the scenes to meet the people who are leading NTBG science and conservation work. As you know, um, Hawaii's flora is really unique. Um, we have about 13, 60 native species, and the majority of those are found nowhere else on Earth due to many years of isolation. But um, our native plants and animals are threatened and there's already more than 130 plant species that have gone extinct in the last 175 years. So this is dire news, of course, um, but luckily there's a lot more awareness of this challenge today and NTPD is working with many other partners across the state to help stop these extinctions and restore our native forests. So this series of webinars is designed to zoom in on the many different aspects of this work. And here in February, it's Invasive Species Month. So today's webinar will be zooming a little bit in on some of the work we're doing to fight invasive species in our gardens and preserves. So you'll be hearing from NTBG's curator of living collections, Mike DeMotta, and our director of Kahanu Garden and Preserve, Mike Opkenorth. But we also, um, while we're trying to keep invasives at bay, there's other work going on trying to bring rare Hawaiian plants into horticulture to help conserve them. So at the end, uh, we have University of Hawaii student John Steinhorst, who's also an intern uh, with NTBG, sharing his story about um, his work on the native Hawaiian caber. So we hope you will find these um, inspiring talks and that you'll learn something new. Um, and we look forward to lots of questions in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. So uh, our first panelist today is going to be Mike Demota. So Mike, go ahead and open with some words for us. Good morning or good afternoon. Aloha, everybody. My name is Mike Demota, And as Nina said, I'm the curator for Living Collections for the National Tropical Botanical Garden. And I um, have worked in a various uh, um, operations here at NTBG and in, in our different gardens uh, in my current position. As curator, I help our and work with our garden directors, including Mike Opkinorth, uh, with managing all of our garden collections on, a, on an institutional level. Uh, that would include our canoe plants, for example, and, and all of our native collections. Uh, I worked pretty intensely at Limuhuli Garden, uh, for example, uh, developing the native collections in the garden there, and then assisting with um, collections and our planting uh, in the restoration site uh, in the lower valley. So I have had to work with uh, invasive species in lower Limuhuli Valley, as well as in the upper valley, uh, quite a bit before. Um, as curator, though, managing the collections here also is, it, it's also a part of my function to, to pay attention to the collections themselves to be sure that our collections are not becoming uh, invasive or, or, or even just weedy. Um, one definition, so for one definition for invasive species is um, it's an organism that causes ecological or economic uh, havoc in a new environment where it is not native. And, uh, you know, in Hawaii, that's, it's not hard to become invasive because, you know, the islands have been isolated for millions of years. 
Now, they're all volcanic, so they li literally popped out of the middle of the ocean. And anything that made its way here uh, did so, but very infrequently, oftentimes tens of thousands of years separated introduction events. Uh, one seed could have arrived here, um, and that's it from that family of plants. And that, that seedling would have had to uh, evolve and adapt to the environment, the volcanic environments here. And then, and then it would have changed as the islands got older and, and the environments changed as well. So with, with less competition than some of the continental ecosystems, uh, Hawaii's plants uh, and eventually the birds and other insects that arrived were, were very vulnerable uh, to a, a catastrophic introductory events of, of much more aggressive plants and, and, and animals. So in the couple of uh, hundred years since the coming of the West, uh, great changes in our ecosystems with the influx of large agriculture. Uh, plants uh, were brought here for farming, of course, but also as ornamentals for people's backyards. Even a couple of hundred years ago, uh, fruit trees were brought. You know, think of all the immigrants that came to Hawaii as contract laborers for the sugar plantations. When they let, were leaving their homelands, they brought seeds for vegetables and fruit trees and whatnot that they knew they'd want to have uh, to plant when they got to their new homes in Hawaii. So uh, that was the first source for plants that could have become invasive. Um, so invasive is caused economic and ecological harm. Not everything that spreads slowly is considered invasive. Uh, plants that uh, might spread around your backyard if you brought seeds in <clears throat> that don't necessarily uh, go all over uh, <clears throat> the area that you're living in, uh, they consider that sort of naturalized to your environment, but not necessarily invasive. Our function here, like uh, here at, the, at NTBG for, for my part, is to watch the collections that we have because horticultural introductions uh, are a, a notorious source for, in, for invasive species. So not only botanical gardens, but even the uh, horticultural industry, plant nurseries import stuff from all over the tropics, uh, in beautiful and interesting horticultural plants that have the potential for becoming invasive, but more than just the plants themselves, the little creatures that hitchhike there on their way over as they're being imported to the Hawaiian Islands um, could also become in invasive. So uh, here in our gardens, particularly here on the South Shore, um, we're always paying attention to, to our collections to be sure they're not showing signs of weediness. Uh, plants or trees that drop seeds where thousands of seedlings sprout under the, under the original tree is really a good first step to be paying attention to that. And if you start seeing these plants popping up in other parts of the garden for us here on the south shore of Kauai, uh, that's cause for concern. And when there are plants that show signs of aggressive invasiveness, we will remove them from our collections here. Uh, NTBG has signed on back in 2006 uh, as, uh, to the voluntary codes of conduct for botanical gardens, as well as for the green industry. And, uh, you know, most of our collections that are new that come in uh, every year are native plants anyway, because our field work and our Hawaiian conservation programs are very strong here at NTBG. So most of our field work involves the collecting of native plants. Uh, but from time to time, we will be offered or we'll sometimes bring in plant material that's from some other part of the world. Uh, and if we're not familiar with uh, the potential for invasiveness, we will submit, submit that to the Hawaii uh, Pacific Weed Risk Assessment. They will then uh, look, at, look at the plant and, and do the research to see if th that plant uh, has invasive tendencies or has been noted uh, in other parts of the world. So we're very cautious about being a source uh, of invasive species for, for uh, our communities all over the Hawaiian Islands. Um, but a little bit of, a little bit of research, uh, they estimate that there have been at least 5,000 species that have become invasive in Hawaii in the last century or so, um, about 1,300 of those being plant species. Uh, I think uh, for those who live in, in Hawaii, if you've been to the island of Hawaii in the last 10 years, uh, the most obvious invasive species uh, in the Hilo area is the koki frog. And, um, you know, they, uh, they discovered koki frogs on Kauai many years ago as well, but they were actively, the Kauai Invasive Species Committee took an active approach, a proactive approach in controlling and eventually eradicating koki frogs on the island of Kauai. It did take a long time. But uh, on the Big Island, they're, they're pretty well established and there's very little likelihood that they'll be able to control that. So uh, again, we take a very, a very serious responsibility of ours to be sure that we're not bringing plant collections in that have potential for invasiveness and can escape in into our natural environment because 
Invasive species are a serious concern in our native forest systems on all of our islands. Invasive plants are very uh, aggressive and uh, outcompete many native plants uh, who are, you know, have evolved in, in their ecosystems and are just not capable of dealing with these faster growing and aggressive uh, invasive species, but also insects um, and, uh, and animals. Uh, working with native plants here at our nursery, uh, invasive insects, non-native invasive insects are a real issue, not just in our collections, but even in the wild. Uh, insects and plant pathogens um, are causing a lot of problems with plants, even in their native ecosystems. So um, anyway, I just wanted to cover uh, some of our responsibilities as a botanical garden. We take it very seriously. Um, we uh, screen any non-native plant collections that come here for invasiveness before we are willing to put them out. And then we monitor them very closely for, not just for the initial outplanting, but for years after they've been planted out to be sure that we're not uh, experiencing invasiveness. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike, appreciate it. So we're going to move on to Mike Off North, the director of our Kanu Garden Preserve. And he has uh, some information to share with you about some specific projects there. Hey, mahalo, Amanda. Aloha, my kako. Good to see everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm going to share a little bit of some photos, kind of connect you to the space that I'm going to be talking about in this presentation. So one moment here. Okay. So for wherever you are in the world, uh, for a few moments, you're going to join us here on Maui in Hana. And uh, for those of you who haven't been here before, we invite you to come down and, and join us here. But uh, today we're going to be talking about one of the activities that um, NTBG staff does here in Maui at our Kahanu Garden and Preserve. And uh, you'll see a picture here. This is actually of the, the, the garden, the botanical garden itself. You see a beautiful haleva'a or canoe house um, just at the, at the foot of Pi'ilani Haleheao out there in the distance. So I'm uh, going to be sharing a little bit about some of the biocultural resources at Kahanu Garden and Preserve, uh, some site-specific invasive plants that we deal with here. And then I'm gonna share with you folks a little bit about how we um, work to, to mitigate these threats. You see a beautiful photo on the right here, taken just a few weeks ago from the Hala Preserve. And so this, uh, this plant, Pandennis tectorius, will come up um, further in the presentation, but a really important um, ecologically um, you know, suited plant for this, this environment and also something that's an important cultural resource. But first I wanna ask you folks a question. Looking at some of these plants and animals on the screen, I'm wondering if anyone knows the names of any of these plants or animals. So uh, if you have access to the chat, I think you should be able to. Um, if you can fire off the name of any of these invasive species you see here. And these are all invasive species here in Hawaii. It'd be great to see. Okay, we have a vote here for mule deer. Lantana, Myconia, Lantana on the upper right. Flame tree, nice, Jerry. But um, yeah, unfortunately that's African tulip, um, but it definitely does kind of have that, that look of a flame, I guess. It's the African tulip, another boat there. Um, yeah, and, and some other great answers. So I'm seeing Albizia. Um, that's actually um, not this one on the bottom. Um, second to the left on the bottom, that's actually a um, Lucena or Haulikoa. Yep, got a foot for Halikoa there. Good. Yeah, and of course, you see the mosquito. I think everyone knows mosquitoes. That's Aegis aegypti. That's an introduced mosquito. And to share another fact with you folks, there's actually no native mosquitoes in Hawaii. So all those mosquitoes that you see are have been brought in. And so I'll kind of scroll through some of the other ones. Maconia on the top left, correct for some of you there that I think I saw Kelly... Jessica all voted, got my conia in there, very good. And that's a plant that's really a, a big target for um, a lot of the main Hawaiian islands. Lantana on the top right. Um, I saw a vote for deer, that's actually axis deer. Um, there's many kinds of deer and this one's actually native to India. Um, big problem here on uh, Maui, Molokai and Lanai. And down on the bottom, we have, um, we have Clydemia. I don't know if, yep, I see Jessica mentioned that as well. So. Yeah, thanks you guys for participating. Great to kind of just get a gauge of everyone's knowledge of invasive plants. So, and then like Mike said, you know, some of these plants are actually brought in for ornamental. So looking at that 
beautiful orange African tulip tree on the bottom left corner, you wouldn't know, hey, that was a, that actually got out of its, um, it, the yard that it was planted in became something that uh, became a bit of a, an issue for the rest of us. So we'll move on here. So reconnecting you back to this space, um, Kahanu Garden Preserve is located in Honoma'ele uh, in Hana, Maui. And uh, it's, you know, two and a half hour drive from Kahului Airport to get out here. But once you do, you're certainly in a different world, but um, also one of the most important places here in, in old Hawaii. Um, in the center of the photo, you actually can see the outline of Pi'ilani Haleheao. It's the foundation in which this garden started in the 1970s. Um, the way the garden started is actually the lineal descendants of this place um, connected with the National Tropical Botanical Garden and decided, hey, you know, it's time to restore this heiau, um, you know, open a botanical garden uh, honored to Chief Kahanu, who was a chief here in the 1800s. And so that's what we've done over the years. Just a few snapshots from the garden, whether it's the plants, the canoe plants, like Mike Demona mentioned, we have kalo and uh, coconut at the bottom process of building Hale, a cultural practice we perpetuate today, and even a couple photos of the heiau before and during the, the restoration. And then on the left, you actually see a few photos of, uh, you know, the Hawaiian monk seal and some beautiful tide pools that are right on the edge of the Kahanu Preserve. And so you may be asking, well, what is the Kahanu Preserve? Well, it's actually three sections that uh, surround the botanical garden as we know it. Um, it's over 100 acres. A lot of this is um, dominated by Pandanus tectorius, like I mentioned earlier. It's the, called the Hala tree. Um, and there's some areas surrounding Pi'ilani Haleheao out on the point near Kalahu. And then we call it the East Honoma'ele section, which is closer to Hana Town for those of you that are familiar. So a couple of photos for you that are not too familiar with this plant that I mentioned, um, also called screw pine. Um, this part of the Pandanaceae family, and it's actually quite a large family with over 100 uh, recognized species. And this one, Pandanus tectorius, is um, indigenous to Hawaii, but it was thought that it was just Polynesian introduced at one point. Um, this is a plant that's useful for, you know, weaving sails, weaving crafts, hats nowadays. You see quite a few of them and used to be a practice um, perpetuated widely in Hawaii. And all the parts of the plant were used. It wasn't just the leaves, you know, the roots could be made into kapa. The fruits, like uh, the photo on the top left, you see of the fruits could be made um, into lei, or um, even those um, fruits could be dried and used as paintbrushes in the old days. So many different uses to this plant. It's really quite ornamental as well. Ah, but the African tulip tree, bringing back what I mentioned earlier, and this beautiful ornamental did escape. And uh, part of the reason is, is uh, because of its ability to disperse. Um, this plant every year, um, e each healthy plant will produce hundreds, if not thousands of fruits um, within just one, one tree. And, and those, those seeds, like you see on the top left, are very small, they're very light, and they've been designed to um, maximize on that opportunity. If the slightest wind comes in, the seeds will be grabbed by the, you know, those wind and carried for very far distances. On the right is right at the edge of the Kahanu Preserve. And part of this picture actually is part of our property as well that we try to steward. And you can see the orange blooms of this African tulip tree invading the coastal forest. Of the other invasive species we deal with is this one called inkberry, Ardesia elliptica. This is actually from India as well, like the axis deer was, but um, this plant has become naturalized in all of the main Hawaiian islands and it grows in really thick clumps. And so on the left, you see this photo of uh, one of our previous interns here at NTBG, Shaila. She's working to get to the base of these plants and pull them out, but you can really just see how dense these plants grow. And one of the challenges is about these plants is not only producing a lot of seed that are easily dispersed, but the way that they grow in really dense, aggressive um, clumps, that prevents any other plants from getting started and getting some of that much needed sunlight. So you see the, the larger pandanus trees on that picture on the left still holding on, but you don't see any young plants there. And that's something that concerns us. This, however, is something that we like to see. We like to be able to see the canopy floor um, often intermingled with native ferns and other things that um, aren't necessarily taking the entire forest floor away from the pandanus trees. And this is an example where you could actually see some of the regeneration of young hollow trees. Um, you see one on the left and on the right of this photo. And um, yeah, just a really good example of a nice mature pandanus forest. 
This type of forest is also important for other uh, native species, some of which are endangered, like the one on the bottom left, that's Hilo moraine grass, Ishmaeum byroni. Um, and then Kolo Kolo Kahakai um, on the top left there, an ocean primrose is growing near the, ho the Hala Preserve. And again on the right, just a beautiful photo of this forest when it's intact. Some of these uh, invasive species are not so easy to see from far away. This is Hollis scale. Uh, one of the really you know, important um, pests that actually got introduced, we think in the 90s from, again, probably an ornamental plant brought from the Southeast uh, uh, or Southwest Pacific area, uh, likely Fiji and brought to Hawaii. And then of course it escapes, right? So these scale insects are very small. You wouldn't know until you went right up to a leaf but you can see how just on one leaf, there's hundreds and thousands of these small scales attacking these leaves. Um, and enough of them can you know, suck enough juice out of each of these leaves to really weaken the tree's health. And that's something that takes a really broader approach rather than just going in and pulling the, the tree uh, invasive plants out. This is something that requires kind of a more landscape scale um, approach to solve something like biocontrol is one thing that's been brought up for this, this pest. Something that we don't have at the garden, but hopefully we never have, is little fire ant. And this is something that's been found, um, I believe, on pretty much all of the main Hawaiian islands, but it's been mitigated on most of them. Uh, the island of Hawaii, the big island, is the one that's dealing with it probably in the, the largest abundance. Uh, but we've been able to kind of keep it at bay or in certain closed areas here on Maui. Uh, but this is one of the top 10, you know, noxious, um, or excuse me, invasive species in the world that causes major damage, not only to ecosystems, but also to our everyday lives. These are ants that sting when they bite you. They can also make animals go blind if enough of them can uh, bite animals. So it's really kind of sad how invasive species can also change our way of life when uh, something like this arrives at our shores. Um, also like mosquitoes, I mentioned earlier, there's actually no native ants to Hawaii. So any of the ants that we can get rid of, we're pretty happy about. Just you can see some of the statistics here on the money that's been spent on Hawaii Island alone, 174 million in one year. But what's the big deal, right? Why do we, you know, address invasive species? Well, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature has stated the, that the impacts are, are immense, insidious, and usually irreversible. It may be as damaging to native species and ecosystems on a global scale as the loss and degradation of habitats. So this is up there in some of the biggest concerns that we have for the future of our ecosystems. These types of invasive species can affect socioeconomic factors, you know, agricultural damage. At, you know, at some end, we reduce access to clean water. Um, and on the environmental side, you know, sometimes that leads to soil erosion when invasive species take over an environment. You don't have as high level of a biodiversity as a natural forest would be. And so these are all things that we take seriously and are tied into to our mission. But there's good news, you know, we're doing things to move forward and there are things that you guys could do to support. Being here today is one of them, you know, getting to know our resources, getting to know the challenges that we face. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to understand that. But some things that we're going to be working on moving forward, we're going to try to increase our capacity uh, in the Kahanu Preserve to kind of move more into to further areas and mitigate things like African tulip and um, Ardesia elliptica inkberry. And supporting our nursery operations, that's another great way to help us um, move forward and, and getting other companion plants into our forest preserve. And, you know, collaborators, people that are involved in this subject, please, you know, let your voice be heard on, on these kind of problems being a significant part of uh, the threats that we face, you know. So collaborating with others is something that we'll be doing in the future as well. I had to include one more monk seal photo just because they rely so much on this, this coastal forest and, and we really love it when they come by. With that, mahalo for your support. I'll pass it back to Amanda. Thank you so much, Mike. Appreciate it. So our last panelist today is John Steinhorst, and uh, he is going to talk about uh, his project that he's working on, which is uh, working with native plants and promoting them in horticulture. So go ahead, John, take it away. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, are you folks able to see that photo there? Yes. 
Okay. Well, aloha. I'm John Steinhorst, a master's student at the University of Hawaii's Tropical Plant and Soil Sciences. I've been researching potential native plants to incorporate into landscaping practices while working as a science and conservation intern at NTBG. I want you to take a close look at this photo. It shows the lush green vegetation common to Hawaii, Uluvehi Bay. But can you spot the only native plant in the photo struggling for nutrients and sunlight amidst all the invasive exotic plants? As you know, many of Hawaii's native plants are being threatened by extinction due to introduced invasive species. So I'd like to present an example of one vulnerable endemic plant in particular, and I'll be talking about conservation horticulture for the native Hawaiian caper. Many people are familiar with the common caper used as food and medicine throughout the Mediterranean. However, less people are familiar with the native Hawaiian caper, Capra sandwichiana known as Mayapilo in Hawaiian. Like many other Hawaiian plants, the native caper is a species of concern due to decreasing wild populations. Mayapilo is classified as vulnerable by the IUCN. The main threat is habitat loss due to coastal development and invasive exotic weeds. This endemic species is also prone to herbivory, stem rot, slow growth, and poor regeneration. Like many native Hawaiian species, it cannot compete with fast growing invasive plants. So here's an example of the native caper growing along the Mahalepu Heritage Trail being choked out by invasive weeds like Haulikoa, Brazilian Christmas berry, ironwood, pigeonberry, sourbush, and various other grasses and weeds. This is what the site looked like after manual removal of all the surrounding invasive species. Uh, my apilo plant was struggling to grow underneath the fast growing weeds. Other invasive species causing damage to my apilo include predators such as ants, snails, rodents, and leaf miners. You can see evidence of insect leaf damage in the center of the image, which may have been caused by cabbage loopers. Myopilo is an important target for ex situ and in situ conservation restoration. For centuries, Hawaiians have used the plant to mend fractured and broken bones. Its fragrant flowers open from sunset until mid morning to attract a wide range of pollinators. And since these plants withstand dry conditions, they could also serve as ideal additions to rock gardens and xeriscape settings. Incorporating native species into landscaping practices is one method of conservation that can allow people to develop greater appreciation for Hawaii's unique plants. The photo on the left of this cultivated caper was taken in the evening when the fragrant flower was in full bloom. Uh, maybe you could even picture this pretty plant growing in your home garden or on a rock wall. Bringing native plants into urban settings could potentially offset habitat loss caused by development. Observation in the wild can also help us develop a closer understanding of these plants to create effective management plans. As the only native Hawaiian species in the caper family, further research is needed on its general ecology, life history, population, distribution, genetics, and other trends. Little is known about Myopilo seed characteristics, including dormancy, which is a seed property that determines conditions for germination. However, there is current research on the closely related common caper, Capra spinosa, whose buds and fruits are used as condiments with numerous health benefits. Some research attributes its hard seed coat to physical dormancy, while other germination studies indicate physiological. Some genus members are implied to have a combination of seed characteristics. A better, more complete understanding of seed germination storage and propagation of the species could provide valuable information to conservationists, horticulturists, and land managers for growing success. We've been conducting experiments to evaluate seed dormant seed characteristics of Capra sandwichiana, and these fruits were collected from Makavai Cave and allowed to ripen in the lab to prevent from being eaten by rodents, birds, or insects. Uh, the enlarged image on the right shows the fruit pulp attached to the outer coat seed. Here's a photo of a cross section taken 
under the microscope saying the, showing the surrounding mucilage around the seed, which may serve as a germination inhibitor. Uh, so for this experiment, I nicked or scarified 50 seeds with a razor opposite the hilum to determine if the seed coat was water permeable. 50 nicked seeds and 50 non-treated seeds were then placed in Petri dishes on moistened germination paper. And after predetermined intervals, the seeds were blotted dry, weighed, and compared with initial weights to determine if the seeds were indeed water permeable. The data comparing the imbibition experiment shows that both the treatment and control increased mass at similar rates, demonstrating a water permeable seed coat. This indicates that myopilo does not possess physical dormancy and more studies are needed. We will continue researching best approaches to create dormancy breaking conditions and remove germination inhibitors with additional plans to determine effective pathogen abatement and propagation methods. This is a special plant that deserves more attention and we plan to conduct further research on seed dormancy, viability, germination and storage to help preserve this unique beneficial species. Further research will help provide conservation managers, landscape designers, and nursery growers with valuable information to increase production efficiency and ensure Hawaii's vulnerable plants like the native Hawaiian caper can continue to flourish. Uh, thanks for listening. And thanks to the National Tropical Botanical Garden, Makawai Cave Reserve, Maxwell Hanrahan Foundation, University of Hawaii at Manoa, and the Red List Project for all their support. And thanks for your support. Uh, please let me know if there's any questions. Mahalo. All right, thank you, John. So we're gonna open it up for the general Q&A. So if you had any questions uh, from for any of our panelists, feel free to drop those in. And while you all are typing into the chat box, uh, we have a poll for you. So we're curious, do you use native plants in your home gardens? So go ahead and answer the poll and uh, start typing in your questions into the chat box. And I don't know if it, any of our other panelists had any comments they wanted to add that maybe they didn't get into their presentation. You're welcome to do that now as well. So I'll, I'll end the poll here and, oh, okay. We got a question from Phoenix. Uh, they were wondering how can we get seeds for uh, the plant that you're working on, John? Oh, that's a great question. Thank you for asking. And that's one of the reasons we're doing this research to um, study uh, characteristics of the seeds that uh, make it easier for distributing them to the public. Um, there are some factors as um, desiccation and drying the seeds. And generally the seeds don't last very much longer than five years in um, refrigerated storage. So that's just one of the things we're working on. And thanks for your question. Hopefully we can, uh, with some of this research, make these uh, amazing plants available to the public. Thanks, John. And then I just wanted to share the poll results real quick. So uh, the majority of folks who are joining today do indeed use native plants already. Great, awesome. And then I saw some other questions come through. So the next one, it looks like is from Britta. I am curious if weed risk assessment info on the Hawaiian Ecosystems at Risk Project now being maintained in the Pacific Island Ecosystem At-Risk Project, is used to make management decisions in the garden? If so, what does that look like? Um, you, you know, to start with, uh, we don't, I feel a little bit lucky in that we don't get many collections that are not um, of Hawaiian origin to begin with. And so um, when I do get collections that, I, that are shared with us from other gardens here in Hawaii, I still do um, research to see what, uh, if the plant is known to have invasive tendencies. Um, but the weed risk assessment um, is most useful when, when uh, material comes in from another part of the Pacific or even another country, and we don't really know uh, if anybody in Hawaii that's already growing it. Um, Honestly, the last time I had that happen, it's been 
quite a few years uh, since I've last had anything come in that I really was concerned about. Uh, in the last maybe three to five years, we actually have submitted uh, for ornamental plants that we were wanting to use uh, sort of as short-term bedding plants. So I submitted that just because uh, some of the some of the risk factors that I immediately recognized were, you know, dry uh, seeds, small seeds, easily wind dispersed. So th those were of concern to me, and I submitted that to the weed risk assessment. Um, but you know, horticultural these days, many horticultural specimens are sterile. They're usually hybridized, uh, different species that are hybrid, and so the so the plants produce sterile seeds. But but um, if we do find, and I'll give you a, a, an example here. Uh, there are two species in the genus Macaranga, which uh, they can be very large trees that are found in the Philippines and Southeast Asia. They're very weedy uh, in the islands in the Kui area of Kauai. There's one species of Macaranga that is naturalized uh, and it's, it's very prevalent. It's one of the first things to sprout up uh, after you disturb the ground. But there's a larger, very aggressive species called Macaranga mapa that is uh, pretty much only known from around the Hilo airport. It is also naturalized in that area. And um, we had uh, we have two uh, planted, that the, the Allertons planted down in Allerton Garden. And so uh, it was a big concern of mine that we had these trees here, because, knowing of their invasive potential, uh, which is well documented on the Big Island. So we took a very systematic approach. Uh, we wa waited for it to go into flower and discovered that the two trees that we have were both female flower trees. And I'm not sure if the Allertons knew, did that on purpose or not, but it worked out that they were female flowered. And so it was less of a concern. We do monitor for Macaranga in our gardens and in Lawai Valley anyway, uh, but we chose to leave those trees for the time being since they were both female flowered and not, and not reproductive. So, so using the weed risk assessment and other tools that are available to us, we had the Kauai Invasive Species Committee come in and, doc and, and take two G uh, GPS points for our trees so it's in their, uh, in their database uh, for future reference in case anybody here doesn't remember that we, that we did all this. Uh, the KISC folks already have it in, in our database. So collaboration with other agencies, because there's, there's a lot of things to, to be done. So collaboration is really the best way so that more people know uh, this information and it can be shared amongst those who are interested. Thanks, Mike. We had kind of a, a similar question to some of the resources you were just mentioning. Uh, somebody was wondering, what is the best resource to learn about invasive species in our local areas? Uh, cooperative extensions, universities, question mark. You know, my first, <laughs> I, think, I think this is going to be an easy answer, though, but my first, my first step is to Google it. I will Google, the, if, I can, if I can find out the scientific name, I'll Google genus species and then put Kauai after that. And anything relevant that has to do with Kauai will be, will be the first things that come up. Honestly, sometimes the weed risk, weed risk assessment folks um, uh, pretty much use search engines to see if it's something that they don't readily recognize. They'll use the search, search engines to see if, the, if that genus and species comes up elsewhere in the world. And uh, if it is an invasive species, because there's so much attention on it, invasive species are not just a problem in Hawaii. As, as Mike Opkenworth mentioned, IUCN and others recognize it as a major threat to native biodiversity all over the world. Even in a place like Africa, where there's huge uh, swaths of, of you know, wildlife and, and grasslands and forests and all, there are invasive species even in Africa. So it's a serious concern. And um, uh, I, I think we're at the stage here in Hawaii, at least, where we're trying to be sure not to um, bring in anything new that might be aggressive that will affect our ecosystems even more. Uh, and so, you know, the heightened awareness uh, of everybody is, is really important. And for those of us in, in Hawaii, uh, you know, even pathogens, a rapid ohia death is a really good example of something that just showed up and then spread rapidly on its own until we all understood how it spread. Um, we didn't realize how to control it or at least uh, prevent the quick spread of it. And so everyone's, there's heightened awareness and education is a really important tool in control of invasive species. Thank you. Uh, we had a question from Susan who was wondering, do fruit eating animals promote invasion of the invasive species plant? Um, you know, so we, that, that's a good question. And the, the biggest fruit eating animal that's not native to Hawaii would be the feral pigs. 
And yes, they do contribute very much so to the spread of uh, whatever happens to be in season. Uh, they love guava and they spread guava seeds by eating the fruit and then and then spreading them around in a little package of fertilizer automatically. They, the, the fruits also attach to their fur and their hooves. And so that's another way of spreading it around. And, and, and we all eat fruits too. There's a way that we do the same thing. If we're hiking through guava forest and we come out of that guava forest, we really need to look at our shoes and clean them off really, really well. Bio, you know, biosecurity. Go home, you clean your boots, you clean your backpack and all your hiking gear to get all those guava seeds or grass seeds. Um, Mike had a picture of, of cane grass uh, from Hana. There are um, grasses that are used from time to time ornamentally that can be really, really serious. So, uh, you know, it, it, we all need to contribute to that. But feral pigs are probably the biggest uh, um, culprits for spreading around this, the seeds of fruit. Speaking of hiking, uh, George was wondering, in Alakai Swamp, there are hundreds of thousands of ginger plants. Is there any hope in removing them? That's a very good question. And, uh, you know, uh, I worked very closely with the uh, Kokea Resource Conservation Program for many years. And ginger, um, it's really interesting, the story of how that ginger made its way up there. But uh, ginger is so pervasive. It is, you know, it's a seeding form of ginger. So they spread, the birds spread the seeds around as well as the rhizomes. And so the strategy, at least the last time I, I, I talked about this with somebody from KRCP, the strategy was the, a line in the sand. So they, so they have um, a point uh, into the Alakai Swamp where they will not, they, they focus their efforts on not allowing ginger beyond the, the, there's a point, and I don't know what the, the GPS points are, but they have created a map and anything on, uh, I guess it would be anything on the northwestern side of that line, uh, they don't expend a lot of resources. They will control ginger within that zone, for example, along the Pihea Trail. They do have work areas going down the uh, Nualolo Trail and the Avava Puhi Trail and so forth. They will do mitigation there, but they but there's a line uh there's a red line that they do not allow ginger to cross going into the swamp. And uh, I guess the rough, roughly would be somewhere just past the Alakai Swamp Trail. Um, and they want to prevent the ginger from actually invading the, the majority of, of the, of the Alakai Swamp. So yeah, there, there's concentrated efforts to, to attack patches of ginger that escape beyond their line. And, uh, you know, they, they could spend all of their resources. In fact, they could spend the resources of every institution that controls invasive species in Hawaii on just the ginger problem in the swamp. So, so rather than trying to tackle it all, they're just trying to prevent further invasion into the more pristine swamp areas further up in, in the Alakai. Thank you. So Jessica had uh, two kind of related questions. So she was wondering, are ants controlled in the garden? So do we do, we do any control for ants, pest management? And are there concerns about invasive species coming into the garden from adjacent lands? So we maybe I can... let, let me just let me just cover the, the real quick one about it coming in from adjacent lands. We have had uh, some invasions in the Hawaii Valley that we've gone up to the landowners to talk to them about removing a, a tree that's the source of an invasive species, but um, it, it's it's really hard to 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 do more than more than just that. Okay, Mike, go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, so um, control of the ants, oftentimes, too, you got to be specific about what ant you're targeting because there's different ways to um, approach different ant species. So the one that I mentioned in the presentation, little fire ant, that's one that we're very actually fortunate the Maui Invasive Species Council comes in and tests the property regularly. And, you know, there's certain areas that, that they'll go to and congregate, like they'll, that ant species will go up into trees. And that's also part of the things that makes this such a nasty type of ant is you're out there doing yard work and you're cutting down a banana plant or trimming a tree and then you have ants raining on top of you. So um, in the little fire ant, that's one way that they approach them. But, you know, of course, there's different specific ways to, to control ants and depending on the species, they require a different approach. But the really high um, uh, management areas include our nursery and um, agricultural collections in the garden. Thank you. John, this one's for you. It's another question about uh, the species you're working with, the caper. Uh, can you get, uh, uh, can you propagate with cuttings or is it just seeds? Um, yeah, we have had limited success with propagating stem cuttings. And basically uh, we use about the first um, 
six inches of the tip and planted in um, black cinder with some kind of growing medium like cocoa core or peat moss or something like that. Uh, but we're still working on that. Um, we have a, a mist area in our nursery and that makes it quite a bit easier. Other, otherwise, it's not, um, it's definitely not a hundred percent guarantee with uh, propagation of those cuttings. All right, thank you. So it looks like we have answered all the questions currently, but if anybody had any last ones they wanted to throw in there, please feel free to ask us. We do still have a few more minutes left. Uh, but if any of our panelists have any final words they'd like to leave people with, uh, feel free to chime in. Never being, a, never for lack of things to say, I just, I want to just throw something in really quick at the end, uh, based on what, what John just said and, and other, other parts of his presentation. Um, we, you know, as a native plant um, uh, propagator for many, many years, I've, I've always encouraged people to use native plants in their landscapes. And uh, part of part of the reason that uh, my appealo, what John is working on, is not so readily available, is um, understanding and knowing what native plants are. So I, I mentioned this earlier that education is really important for you know for people to understand uh, what an invasive species is, is and how to control that. But um, native plant, uh, the use of native plants in the landscape, education is also very important for that. So. Uh, when more people are interested in native plants, then more native plants will become available. It's sort of an economic thing. Um, and uh, hopefully, you know, we can all get ahead of that curve and start making more native plants available. Um, most of them are easier to grow than most people realize. Uh, it's just that no one has a lot of experience with them on a landscape scale. So um, go to your local nursery and ask them if you're interested, no matter where you are in the country, if you're interested in using native plants in your landscape, and you should be, Go to your local nursery centers and ask them for them. Uh, and again, no matter where you are, the more times you ask and the more people that ask, the more available native plants will become in your area. Thank you. Uh, and then we did have one more question come in from Susan for John. Uh, she was wondering, uh, with our native Florida capers, we have to wait until the fruits open to get the seeds. Is it the same for you? That is correct. And the problem is, well, many of the fruits don't reach maturity because there's so many invasive pests like rats and um, feral chickens and slugs and things like that that eat them before they're mature. Whenever I've seen um, a, a fruit that has actually been able to open in the wild, it's generally covered in ants. Thank you. Um, Nina, did you have any comments you wanted to share? Yeah, I just wanted to follow a little bit up on on the, the points about um, um, several things, I guess. <laughs> yeah, but um, with the, with the native plants, we are actually seeing a, a renewed interest, and I think it links to this whole um, discussion. Several people have said that awareness is really important, both awareness of what is potential weeds, but also awareness of what are what are native plants actually, and it's often kind of surrounded by. Uh, you could even hear some of our gardeners saying, "Yeah, people don't want to see native plants; they want to see something with a big." You know, beautiful flowers and so on. So there's also this awareness of, of appreciating a plant for other things than its big showiness. It could be that it attracts pollinators. It could be that it has this beautiful smell in the in the late evening when you sit in your garden with with your beer or whatever. Um, so there's it's really um, awareness is, is is an important thing and it's it's happening all over. So in our garden in Florida at the campong, there's currently a project going on where they are trying to show that native um, Florida orchids can actually be grown rather easily in the trees in your garden. And so that's another example. Um, and John's project is an early stage project here. Uh, we're trying to get you to hear what's going on right now. Um, so that's that's why it's not in Home Depot and, and so on yet. Maybe you can find it at a, at a plant sale if you're lucky. But um, it is definitely a, a, an interesting way into the future. And what we wanted to show you here is that this borderline between where plants are something we want and when there's something we not want can be a little bit hard because we don't want the invasive weeds, but we don't mind the ones that are naturalized. And we definitely appreciate the natives going beyond their native areas. So um, so it's kind of a um, yeah a continuum of, of when to worry and when to appreciate plants. But um, thanks, thanks a lot for joining. You've certainly hopefully become more aware and you had some really good questions that are, are useful for us as well. Thanks.
Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. So we'll be sending out an email uh, either today or tomorrow with this recording of the webinar. And we'll also include a link to a survey if you wouldn't mind letting us know what you thought of today's uh, session that just helps us continue to improve our future sessions as well. Uh, and uh, again, we really appreciate having you all here and getting to share our work with you all. So a uh, hui ho everybody, thank you. Thank you. Oh, everybody, thank you so much.